Right. Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Nance, the Managing Director of the Nicholson Project. Thank you for joining us at 12 o'clock on a Thursday for this artist talk with our current exhibiting artist, Zachary Fabry. Um, the Nicholson Project is an artist residency program based in Ward 7 in Washington, DC. Um, and we are coupled with a uh, urban garden and also an exhibition space, and we do other projects um, throughout the city. Um, and Zach is one of is our current and one of our exhibiting artists in our gallery space. So um, Zachary Fabry is a Brooklyn-based interdisciplinary artist engaged in lens-based media and public space. He works across video, drawing, installation, often, I'm really sorry, my dog is barking in the background if this is bothering everybody. Um, he works across video, drawing, and installation, often complicating the boundaries of studio research and performance. He is a recipient of awards that include the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award, the Franklin Furness Fund for Performance Art, the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship, and the BRIC Colleen Brown Art Prize. Fabry's work has been exhibited at Art in General, the Studio Museum in Harlem, El Museo del Barrio, the Walker Art Center, the Brooklyn Museum, Performa, and the Ludwig Museum in Budapest, Hungary. Collaborative projects include the Museum of Modern Art, the Sharjah Biennial, and Pace Gallery. Recent solo exhibitions include Q Art Foundation, the Corn Gallery at Drew, Drew University, and the Nicholson Project. Currently, Zachary Fabry is the recipient of the 2024 Nancy B. Negley Rome Prize at the American Academy in Rome. Very impressive, Zach. Congratulations on all of that. And we are really honored that you are, you've been exhibiting with us at the Nicholson Project. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And for everybody else, um, Zach's gonna you know, share his screen. He's gonna give his talk. If you have questions throughout, please just put them in the chat and, um, or you can save them for the end either way. And then we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And Zach, if you wanna spotlight yourself as well, if you're able to do that, are you able to do that? I can. Let me see. Yes. I think I can do it. All right. Okay. There we go. You're up. Um, thank you, Allison. That was uh, an amazing introduction. Um, and I'm happy to be here today to talk about my work and my process, um, ideas and themes that inform my practice. And um, yeah, and so, you know, it's, I don't want this to feel like a kind of a formal academic lecture, but I'm more interested in like a um, uh, informative, um, casual, playful kind of talk. And I welcome your comments and questions at the end. Um, and, or I guess like if you can kind of put them in a the chat throughout, that'd be great as they come up. Um, um, because I mean, I would start by saying that I make my work because of my curiosities of the world. And I'm a very curious and playful person and I have all kinds of crazy thoughts that I kind of uh, kind of like funnel them through the art, um, art world, artwork. And, but I'm interested in the, the work also being like a vehicle or prompt for discourse or discussion or conversation. So like, even though like I'm my first audience and I have to make the work for me, um, I'm also interested in the conversation that it happens, uh, that the conversation that comes about after the work is made, after the viewer engages with it. Um, and so all that being said, please uh, don't hold back on all your questions and and uh, comments. So I'll start, but I'll share my screen. And the mic video for Can everyone see uh, the screen that is just orange, orange dirt road? Okay. Um, so I start this talk here. This is a small neighborhood um, called Jardim Canada, 
And that neighborhood is located in the city of Belo Horizonte, which is located in the state of Minas Gerais. And that state is located in the country of Brazil. Um, so in 2010, I was an artist in residence in Jaca, the um, uh, Jardim, Jardim Canada, the arts and tech, art, art and technology in German Canada. I forgot what the exact acronym because the Portuguese in the English translation um, doesn't really sync up from what, how I remember it for the acronym, but it's a residency program in Be Belo Horizonte. Uh, but specifically, um, I start this talk because I'm curious about how I arrived in making work about public space, um, how, how I arrived in kind of uh, making work that involves conversations around sites and the body and urban space, architecture, and um, oftentimes safety or freedom. And so, and all those are kind of interwoven, complicated things. So. I arrived, arrived in this residency program uh, and I didn't know anything about the place aside from what I could glean on the internet or talk to the residency about. So I, I needed to understand where I was and the best way to understand where I was was can I take a walk and to like walk in the land landscape and try to understand and get information from this site. Um, and so the, the first information was that of there's no paved roads, and the roads were just made out of this mineral um, called a hematite, which is mined for um, iron ore. And so there's a huge mine that's like a block away across, across the main road and they mine this orange, this deep orange mineral for iron ore. Um, so, um, what was important for me was to understand that I was a foreign person, a foreigner, I was an outsider, an outsider in this context, right? Um, so already this context has a kind of an economic um, focus on it, um, but also had like class and labor um, uh, themes as well. Um, so the first bit of information as I walked around was like, just the fact that things were just so dirty. Um, cars, like after I was walking with, with my like New York black clothes and my black shirt and black pants and black shoes, after the first day of, of my walk, I came back just completely covered with this like, with this like this orange mineral. And then it was like an aha moment of like, okay, so maybe I don't shoot video, but maybe the video, the recording is the accumulation of dust and dirt. Um, and so I, took my clothes and made them, made a white version of them. I took them to a local kind of tailor and just converted my New York black clothes to like, just like white clothes, white shoes. And then I went on these walks around the neighborhood just to kind of understand like where I was. And this is like one of the first walks and you can see like, this like this pristine um, white clothing. But then at the end of kind of my residency, it became like, just like, like a kind of a, filled with this, with this orange dirt. And this was the kind of installation at the end of the re residency. So you see drawings, this kind of like suits, which I call like kind of analog recording device, this the clothing. And then there's kind of a book that I made a journal. These are these shoes, the book that I had made. I'm always thinking about drawing. Um, and so I would just pick up rocks from the ground and just scribble in the book. And it was a way for me to not overthink what a drawing is or could be, um, but kind of just like think about this as a journal, as if you were just doing journal, journal writings every day. And so I'm gonna kind of go through this stuff quick because I wanna arrive at other um, works that inform my practice. So, um, in addition to the clothing and this kind of journal, I also wanted to have the body represented 
um, in this work and the, the politics of labor and domestic labor. Um, and that pointing to like more like an indoor outdoor economies. Um, so I, I basically rub dirt on different parts of my body and then rub my body on the paper. And this is like me rubbing the dirt on my butt and then me like rubbing my butt on the paper. And this was like, I think my chest, this is my shoulder and arm. Um, this is, I think knees and penis. This is sho shoulder. I think this is leg actually. This is shoulder and arm. I think this is knee and shoulder. And then these are hands. And so you can see like, it's like an all over, like I basically just like saturated my hands with this mineral and pushed the mineral into the paper. Um, and what I was curious about was the relationship of this mineral, the oils from my body and this in the paper. And so there's like a, I don't know, there's like a, maybe a relationship to, to maybe oil painting in that way where there's like, I'm, I'm pigment and then there's an oil, right? And then they, those two kind of combine and then there's a surface. And so it's kind of, um, kind of tapping into like these old ways of uh, making paint or pastels maybe. So this whole project, um, as you as you remember, there's the installation. You see all the drawings, you see the clothing, this book, and I was very conceptually uh, excited and really um, proud of myself. You know, pat myself on the back, thinking without the camera, thinking through more conceptual means of mark making and uh, performance and like and record making. But the curator was like, "Well, what about video?" And I was like, "Well, I'm." I kind of conceptually paused on the video because the video is the, the, the recording suit, right? This clothing. And then they were like, well, we gave you this whole screening room to make this video. You're the video boy. You made all these videos for us um, that, that you submitted. So I was, I was like, okay, fine. And I simply went out to document me walking around. And then that resulted in something a little more playful and more mysterious and more. Um, more poetic and so i won't show you the entire video because it's about four minutes but i'll just bring it up to say that um i often have to trust in the process um and i know that's maybe not a cliche but it's like trust that i i've built up a structure with enough ingredients and components in the work that i don't have to overthink it or think through things again but i can kind of just like follow through and let the work carry, right? And so that's kind of what happened with, with this work, where that, that's me walking. And so as I'm documenting and I start to kind of become playful with my actions. And then I start to um, investigate the kind of material properties of the mineral, like as a dust, um, as a dry medium. Um, But it's also evidence of me, I guess, making making performance for the camera with the intention that there's going to be an edit that's different from the live action, right? So as I'm doing this, I'm thinking through like the lens of the camera, the relationship of my body to camera person, um, and, and potentially how this might be edited. And so there's one moment. In which I didn't I didn't anticipate, but in the editing, it made sense where 
when I was doing this kind of like playful action, right? I was throwing the dirt into the sky. And may yeah, I don't think I, I had that much forethought to understand much more editing, but I was more interested in just like throwing the dirt and seeing it kind of like fade away. Um, but in the editing process, the work was created. Ideas came from the editing in which I was reversing the, the footage. And then it, it kind of clicked about this idea of reverse extraction or this question, is it possible to kind of to put back the minerals into the earth, right? The things that have been extracted through, through the process of mining, um, can one put them back? And that was just kind of a, a, a playful question that when, when I was editing, kind of had a lot of content and had a lot of, held a lot of weight. Um, so then I allowed myself to kind of use this trick, right? And I don't like to do much editing trickery, but I, I thought that it, if I just do a simple reversal, that it would be so transparent, but also effective, right? It'd be less of a trick, but it, it'd have like purpose. I guess watching the whole video, um, in the end, um, after I shoot the video, um, the camera person and I, Gabriela, um, her name is Gabriela Araujo, um, as we're walking away, I look back and I see this kind of like dirt devil that's just kind of like, just like entered that, that space. Um, and I was like, oh my God, take out the camera. We've got to film this, we've got to film this. And it was just like a, like an happenstance. Just this thing just gonna happen to come in, swirl around and kind of fade away. Um, and so all these things, you know, I was like, I walked away and I went home to edit that. And I was like, well, this is how it ends. Um, So um, going forward, like on my walks, I would see things, locations that were interested to me. Um, and then so after I kind of put a, I came to a closure in terms of that, that pigment work and like performance for the camera, then I started to kind of think more again about photography, about location sites. Um, and this was a, a wall that I would walk by all the time. And I love this wall because it, Again, it was me thinking about drawing, but maybe drawing as a process or um, maybe drawing as a social engagement with other people. So this is a wall on which on the bottom of this photo, you don't see it's cropped out that there's a lot of trash that they're, that they're burning on the ground. Um, and so as they burn the trash, the wall gets charred right, with, with, with the smoke. And then people would come and just, uh, take a regular rock and just scribble into that wall. And so it became, for me, graffiti, yes, but more than graffiti, it became like this kind of social interaction of like mark making, drawing, communication, um, and, but something that was um, more than just like the graffiti maker, wanting to kind of tag the wall to let us know that he tagged the wall and that's his name. But this was more uh, more complicated because of the fact that they have to burn garbage is speaks to the lack of the lack of infrastructure um, and economics in that particular site. Um, and but also the kind of um, I don't know the creative nature or the the uh, improvisation around creativity, or just people willing to engage with a site and with 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 drawing in a way. Um, so this kind of gets closer and closer to like maybe the lens and photography, right? And so um, the previous image and also this image, um, this was at uh, the a favela in. Brazil, 
And um, so when I originally kind of was talking about location and being an outsider, a foreigner, this is like a, a perfect example of me being an outsider in Brazil, but also an outsider in this specific economic and social context of, of favela. Um, and, you know, I was very hesitant and I was very aware of the problems of just being a tourist. Um, but being a tourist in a place in which uh, it becomes this other uh, problematic um, voyeurism, right? Uh, so, but I, I didn't want to like not go. So I chose to have the experience. I chose to be that tourist just so I could be an artist and get information. Um, so I took photos and some of the photos that for me were, are worth showing are the ones that in which are, are complex in which they show the different relationships of, of looking and looking through a camera or being looked at, um, being the subject of a photo, um, but also being the photographer who's uh, framing and uh, making someone into a subject. So this particular photo is kind of like interesting because you have the photographer um, and then you have, who's taking a photo, then you have this little kid who lives there with, with the ball and he's kind of like, looking into the viewfinder, right? And then looking at his friend who's kind of being playful. So there's a kind of interesting kind of relationships of characters happening in this one photo. And I think about that a lot in my work because I think about um, the camera and how am I portraying myself and my body? How am I portraying um, the the black male body? Um, am I um, photographing other people? How, how are they portrayed through my lens, through the lens of the camera, but through the lens of my, of my thinking, right? Um, and so photography is not just a neutral uh, image capture device, but it can be quite loaded and powerful um, depending on you know, how the photo is taken. So this particular photo, I like, it's like at first glance, it's just a child getting his hair cut in the, in the barber. But I do like the kind of relationships and the layers of this as well, where you have, so I'm taking a photo, um, but then I'm like taking a photo of this, I think who I think is the father in the red shirt, kind of look, watching his child get his hair, his, his hair cut. Um, but then there's also a mirror that's we're reflecting the entire scene back at me. And so not, not to get too technical, but I feel like photography has a lot to do with these relationships of reflexivity and reflecting. Um, and there's a kind of a back and forth uh, kind of dialogue that happens. That it's like an infinite loop of reflecting back on itself, things reflecting back on itself subject, um, object, uh, author. Um, but also I just love the kind of the tender, um, warm moment of this shot too. Um, this was another uh, kind of like member of the tour. And I like this shot because it's uh, the formal qualities, the, the line that, that he creates, right? He's, body creates this like vertical line because he's taking this photo of this book of this um this pole um but you can kind of follow through his leg and you see the kind of tension in his like butt cheeks and then you see the line through his arms that kind of continues up through the line of that wire and so I always love these moments uh where there's these kind of formal uh, properties of shapes and lines and um, colors and values. And that's ultimately like what, what I strive for in my practice to kind of have a balance of the social, the social political, but also the formal qualities, the properties of, of shape and line and value and form. 
this, um, as we kind of speak about public space and the conditions um, of, of the sites, right? So I mentioned like the burning of garbage and this was like this dumpster there that I took a quick video of and I'll just play it briefly. It's about a 30 second loop. Um, but I like it because of this kind of geometric shape of this garbage can. And then you have this this little uh, this little boy who comes, but like he sees me there um, filming, but he still kind of just like flings the trash in the garbage. Um, and I just love that moment of like these things coming together, um, this like geometric shape, the the the, the unfortunate toxic nature of burning of the trash, um, and this little kid who's been kind of like following us around for the tour. And I have a photo of him as well. So um, leaving Brazil, this was a kind of a, a tourist vacation trip. I don't know, like, take if I ever took a vacation, but this is like me traveling to Croatia in 2010. And, um, you know, I'm always taking photographs, but this particular photograph, again, like I think spoke to the kind of complex and nuanced relationships of, of taking pictures of people, but then also the, the people that you're taking pictures of, like, like what is their, what is, what is their, um their attitude their feelings their permissions whether they're given or not um and the kind of gaze that the eyes have so i just love this kind of like simple kind of almost a like a commercial of like father recording this child his child is like crawling right with his iphone um and then you have in the background you have this young girl on a bike who's giving me this look I don't know if she's looking at the father and the child or she's looking at me, but there's a kind of a question in, in her eyes. Um, and I, I'm, just, I'm just interested in these kind of tensions and relationships. So this is now New York City, 2011, and I'm not gonna do an exhaustive, like this is every work that I've made up to 2017, but I really wanna set the groundwork for how I, how I've been thinking about public space and also an urban context um, in relationship to my body, my black body, and the kind of actions and performances that I've been doing. Um, so this was a kind of a performance arts, uh, uh, it's a performance art conference, uh, uh, biennial, I think it's called. Um, this was called, um, Shoot, I forgot the name of it. Um, Lord, it'll come back to me. It happens on 14th Street every year. Um, and 14th Street runs from east to west, from like 10th Avenue to like Avenue C. Um, and I chose to do mine around like Avenue B and B and C. And so I didn't have like a crazy, um, tight concept other than I knew I wanted to use a crate and put wheels on the crate. And there's more to it as well, but I I eventually like kind of like, I scrunched down in, into that crate and I'm like kind of like rocking myself back and forth, moving across the, the sidewalk and then I'll pop up and then uh, start to uh, kind of perform a monologue. And I just do that over and over again. This is a performance on Fifth Avenue um, called Fortune's Bones. And I basically went inside of most of the kind of museums on Fifth Avenue in New York City, went inside them and did this kind of like ceremonial performance to reclaim the bones of this uh, former slave that had been um, put on display in Connecticut. 
but this is a shot of me kind of like me and my kind of like friends um, going up Fifth Ave in this kind of pr procession. Um, this was at the Met where this whole piece kind of like, um, it arrived, it ended at the Met and it ended in the African wing of, of the Met in which I did this kind of the final kind of a ceremonial performance. Um, and the whole thing was not, there was no permission given to enter those museums and those, those institutions. Um, but the work was curated. It was curated by uh, Rocio Alvarado, um, who was the curator at that time at El Maceo de Barrio. And we had a long discussion about, you know, she loved the project. We had a long discussion about whether or not we should ask permission of each institution. And I was like, you know, I'm not, I don't make my art to get arrested at all, make my art to piss people off or to kind of trigger anyone. Um, but we both um, we both agreed that it would be stronger and maybe in the best interest of the work if she did not get permission ahead of time. So I like that there was even a discussion around that. Uh, let's see where we are. Okay, so lastly, the last work um, that contextualizes the kind of like the background of me working in public space is this work that I did in 2012. Um, it's kind of like a seminal work in many ways. It's like very personal. I'll, I'll play it and talk over it. This is a an excerpt of three minutes. Um, the longer piece is 15 minutes, but um, I used to have these long dreadlocks and they were like like down to my knees. And I, uh -oh. they were down to my knees and I wanted to cut my hair um, because of many different reasons. But I was thinking about themes, about weight and burden and heaviness and lightness around like, ancestry, culture, um, futurity, um, like the politics, things that are old versus things that are new, um, holding on to old things. Um, so this, this work became a kind of a personal work because of I wanted to kind of cut my hair for personal reasons, but also it was like a, a parallel kind of parallel portrait of Harlem as a kind of historical site of black culture. And, um, but also I was thinking about the concept of uh, letting go um, and the work in this, this particular video, there's a kind of ceremony of me kind of tying these balloons to my hair. Um, and then I, in, a, in the park, Marcus Garvey Park, I'm in this kind of top plateau um, and then I, tie the, my balloons and I descend to more street level. And then I go into more of like a busy side street right off of like Fifth Ave at 125th Street in Harlem. I'll kind of skip ahead a little bit with interest of time. So the work was physically and uh, psychologically about release and letting go. Um, and, and, and how to do that. Um, whether, there's, whether it's like ideas, ideologies, um, or identity, personal identity. And so um, site and location become important because like Harlem was a place that I'd lived in for about 10 years. Um, and actually, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of physical bits of Harlem, like I'm sure wedged in my hair. There was a lot of uh, the sites kind of like of that data in my hair. Um, but also it was like me 
thinking through my identity as a person living in New York City, uh, living in a, in a community of like, like Harlem and, um, and, all, and all the kind of the ideologies in relationship to the physical, um, my physical presence, um, the way that I wore my hair. Fast forward to 2017 slash 2022. Um, uh, I make a new work that is a performance for the bystander and also performance for the camera. And there's a kind of duality that happens at the same time. Um, and this is the work here in 2017. Um, I was commissioned by the Barnes Museum in Philadelphia, Philadelphia to kind of um, make a, a, a performance in public space. And 2017, I thought, well, sure, public space has been something that's been organic and fluid in my practice. And I didn't really have to overthink it, but also wanted to be really intentional and specific about the ideas that I wanted to work with. And when I thought about, well, what is my relationship to public space in 2017? It was one that was fraught uh, with tension and uh, precarity and, and fear um, and because of a lot of police uh, violence. And that was 2017. And so just thinking about, thinking about like how how do I perform in public space? How do, how do I perform, how does my body, how do I locate my body in public space and perform like ideas, uh, you know, art ideas? And the way that I solved that problem was through, I guess I, I would let, let the kind of data that lived in my body kind of choreograph the work. Right, and that data is a lived experience of living in the world, living in New York City, living in Harlem, traveling to different countries, um, living as like a black male, um, having altercations with police. Um, I let that information inform and choreograph my movements, but I didn't want the work to just be a kind of a sad portrayal of trauma. Um, I also wanted there to be like playfulness and complexity. And so the work, this entire project in itself has to kind of arrive out of that space. It has to kind of transcend uh, this, uh, this kind of like traumatic uh, experiences and it has to make space for joy. Um, and so I'll just kind of play a little bit of this. So in, it starts with a kind of a light piano motif that I, I uh, composed. And there's also kind of a playfulness of me kind of moving through these bike racks. Oh no. Okay, go back. So yeah, there's a playfulness of me moving through these bike racks. Um, there's a childish, a child like, playfulness, right? But I love this this site because you see these marks in the wall. There are these crazy marks from, I don't know, bikes or skateboarders. I don't know, but there are these beautiful marks on the wall that I always love. And I might go back to that site and, and photograph them. They're just, they, I don't know, they just bring me joy thinking about like how a mark's made other than just like a pencil and or a paintbrush, but like how a mark's made in a public space, in an urban space, how a mark's made by just like living, um, by people moving through space. And I kind of like, I guess, think about my body and the instrument in that way as I'm moving through space, kind of making these abstract gestures. So I'm not gonna show the entire video because it's about nine minutes, but 
this little opening sequence kind of gives you a, like a snapshot of the entire video, right? Because it goes from like this playfulness to a more deeper slowness as you hear this kind of organ sound wash over the video and then my gestures become more concentrated and maybe more intense. And I'll stop there for this particular video just so we can move forward. Um, in addition to the, and I know in terms of the timing, maybe I'm gonna leave about, uh, finish in about five minutes, but um, in terms of the performance, so, you know, when they asked me to submit a proposal, I was like, well, at this point doing so much performance and I was like, I want more in some ways. I want, I want more, like I was bored with just performing and I wanted it to be more complex, I guess. So I told them I went, one day will, will be performance for a video camera and a street audience. And the other day will be for performance for a still camera and a street audience. So they both have this kind of dual um, dual audience, right? Camera and passerby. And on the second day, it was me and my tripod and 35 millimeter camera, black and white film. And I went back to these locations that I'd already, I, I'd already made a map and with my iPhone and GPS enabled, like free selected locations around the city um, for the video and the and the and the film photos, and basically went and performed for a still camera. And um, but the, I forgot my timer at home, and I was in Philadelphia. So I asked my assistant. I was like, "Well, can you press the shutter button?" Um, and you know she's not a photographer per se, so she just didn't feel comfortable. But I was like, "No worry, you can't do any wrong. All you have to do, I've already framed the shots. All you have to do is just press the shutter button." And so each of these shots have a kind of have their own amount of time in which I was performing. So, for example, this one might have been a short amount of time. Maybe this would have been maybe I don't know thirty in thirty seconds. I would say, let's say Bella. In 30 seconds, can you press the shutter button, no matter what I'm doing? Um, same, this might have been like four or five minutes. I remember this being a little longer, um, just because I was really interested in these shapes, these geometric shapes on the wall. And I love that little circle on the left and this like large rectangle, but also this kind of crack that breaks the rectangle and this little curl at the top left of that rectangle, this little curl that kind of comes off the edge. Um, you know, I think about composition and, um, you know, the same way that a painter or any other artist thinks about composition. Um, I think that's why photography, I keep coming back to photography because it allows me to still compose and control elements within a frame. Um, and then my body becomes this like X factor, this um, it's like improvisation um, unaccounted for like element. This one I liked because it's covering my face and it looks like this kind of almost like smoke or steam that's, that's rising. I just love this curve, this like lip on the wall. This lip is also in the video. I have like a, a very specific part of the video in which I'm performing on this lip. And I love this because it's um, my shoes, right next to my shoes are these little metal, this little metal, I don't know what you call them, a little clamp. And I put, they, I think they put that there so skateboarders don't slide along that, right? which is unfortunate because that looks like an amazing thing for skateboarders. Um, 
but I love that I could still kind of activate that, right? That little metal clamp doesn't prevent me from activating it. Um, this was on like a very boring kind of plaza, but I love the light just dissecting that, that space. Um, and I think this was another longer shot, maybe about um, five minutes in which I um, kind of made this kind of movement, dance movement along the edge of that, that shadow. And this was the shot that we got. Here's an installation view of some of these photographs. And here's an installation view of a, of a different exhibition, not the Nicholson Project, but this was the exhibition at Q Art Foundation in New York City in Chelsea. Um, this is where it was first presented last year, I think. Um, what is my calendar? My brain has kind of gotten foamy. But um, so I was happy to present it in New York City in a gallery and then um, really excited to present, to bring it to, to DC and especially the Nicholson Project. This is a sculpture. I won't talk about it because it's a whole other thing. But it's made out of it's made out of memory foam, and it's called the memory foam of George Floyd. So I guess I am talking about it. Um, but it's it's basically about um, what happens when memory foam does not return to form, right? If memory foam memory foam is about returning to form, re like receiving the impression of the body and returning to form, what happens when it doesn't return to form? What happens when that memory is, is uh, that's a kind of permanent impression. Um, and I feel like thinking about that, um, thinking about victim and trauma and the body, thinking about those things as these impressions, these kind of permanent impressions on the body or on the psyche. Um, the body, the individual body, but maybe the kind of public psyche, our kind of shared psyche. I feel like the, the kind of summer of protest around George Floyd was so much about a public shared experience. Um, this is text work. Um, so this I pulled, I didn't talk much about it, um, but this is a quote that I pulled from the book Beloved that's written by Tony Morrison. And that book kind of informs the entire project. It provides this kind of unofficial text or subtext or kind of score. It allows me to kind of pull visual elements and pull texts and feelings and intensities and like a kind of uh, almost like a Gothic nature. Um, and it, it allowed, me, allowed me to kind of uh, create the aesthetic that, 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 that is the work, the kind of darker Gothic aesthetic. But so this quote was important for me to put into the work, this body of work, um, because it does, it does kind of seek to speak to, to what is beyond, right? So the quote is, me and you, we got more yesterday than anybody. We need some kind of tomorrow. And so, um, does speak to like what is beyond, what is next, and how do we move forward? Not how do we forget, but like how do we move forward beyond trauma and experiences that sometimes hold us in the past, sometimes hold us in place. Um, but I think it's important in my work, um, in this project, in my work in general, to be thinking about how do we move forward, but never forget the things that, that, you know, ne never forget about the past and history of course, um, but also kind of like, how do we, how are we informed by our present situation and how are we actively thinking about um, problem solving and moving beyond? And, And I'll kind of leave it there. Um, 
Thank you, Zach. We have a couple of questions in the chat, so I can just read them to you. And um, first one is from Daryl Chappelle. And his question is, um, how was, or if they were, the community at Belo Horizonte the, in Brazil um, was involved during the process of you compiling your work and then the installation that you created? Can you repeat that again? You said, how was, sorry. All right. How was the community in Belo Horizonte um, involved during the process of you either compiling your work or an installation that you created at the end? Or were they involved? Good question. Good question. Um, they were involved in a very organic way. To, I mean, in some ways, oh, in specific ways, that work was a kind of a solitary work that it was about me trying to understand and process who I was in relationship to where I was. Um, but as I walked around, I would speak to people. As people, would, people would speak to me because I'd be this like foreign looking guy. Although I could blend in and be look Brazilian, I, you know, I think. Um, I was dressed in all white, just walking around. And so people would like wave at me, I'd wave back. Sometimes I'd talk to people as best I could, as best, as best their English or my lack of Portuguese. So <clears throat> part of the kind of getting to know my surroundings was talking to people um, in the most organic way possible. But I didn't want to feel like I was surveying or interviewing or collecting data from people. Like I didn't want to be like, like, uh, like a surveyor of that, of that in that sense. But when I had to make the make, get my clothes made, I was happy to kind of like establish a kind of interesting relationship to the kind of tailor there. Um, and then also making that little journal, I went into the city and uh, talked to this kind of bookmaker. They spoke no English, so I kind of prepared some kind of Portuguese words. And like apparently my Portuguese was so bad and the grammar of what I prepared was just so awful. So I'm just using Google translation or something, whatever, whatever was back then, 2010. Apparently it was so bad. They thought it was so cute. They just get, they made the book for me for free. Um, <laughs> maybe just to like push to shoo me away. But so there was like things like that. Um, that was that was really good. Um, and but I guess I think that project was not so much about immersing myself in the community, um, but more on understanding who I was in relationship to people around me. Right. And then another question from Jane Choi. And this kind of goes together a little bit. How do the spectators' reactions or non-reactions to your public performances factor into your work? And are they secondary to the space? Hmm. They are, so they are integral. They are very important. Um, the spectators, the bystanders, um, anyone. So I, I mean, I would say that they are the unexpected audience, right? Those bystanders, people who just kind of happen to look up and see me doing a weird thing. Um, they're important. Um, I think it's important for my work to kind of open up space around what is performance, what is art, um, and how people understand what art is and where art can be. And it's also important that, you know, um, people try to kind of think and understand what they're looking at, I think. So like when you walk into a gallery, you understand that this is art because you're walking into a gallery space. Um, you walk into a theater or dance performance, music performance, you understand exactly what it is because you and in, your intent to go there. On the street or in public space when there's no information um, and sometimes the work is a hybrid, you don't really recognize it as dance or music. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious about their understanding. I'm curious about their, how they process those, those feelings or those thoughts. Um, 
And the second part of that question, I think I can answer. Oh, um, are they secondary to the spaces? So you sort of answered it. Okay, okay, yeah. No, they're, they're important, they're important. I mean, so I would say they are, you know, because I'm, when I, I, okay, I'll be specific and say that when I'm doing performance for the camera, primary is for the camera because I'm doing work for the camera and that work will then result into a video, an edited video. So the primary kind of audience is that camera, the lens. Um, yeah, but the, but I'm, I'm also making a space for people to, to be, I'm making a space that people can, and I want them to kind of uh, be in that space as well. And then um, how do you approach, Darius, Darius asks, how do you approach audio in your work? How do you decide between using sound from the environment versus music that you've composed or added in? Good question. Um, kind of happens, de depends on the piece, but so for example, um, in that Brazil work, um, I had no in ideas around sound other than to capture what was on site. And so there was a kind of this kind of atmospheric construction sound. Oftentimes there was like no sound. And that was, I think that was that little bit of that soft texture was, was good enough for that Brazil piece. For the kind of Harlem balloon work, there were th three bits of sound. So I was thinking about a score for that work and there was three bits of sound. One was um, like, I wanted there to be like a mechanical, like almost like mechanical tape or film winding sound. So I recorded like this little mini tape recorder. So I wanted you to hear me like mechanical, not electric, but like mechanical components. Um, it's like, in the beginning of that 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 work, and then in the middle, you hear me kind of mumble singing as I'm like walking down to the park. There's like a mumble singing. Now, I often like sing to myself as I'm walking in on the street, um, but I like that kind of like like a personal touch. And then lastly, um, when I'm cutting my hair, there's like a kind of an, anticip an anticipatory kind of bell sound i'm just hitting a bottle like i think it was a ginger beer bottle with a pencil at my home and recorded that and it's all really rough and not slick sound but for that video the work is textured and it's about it's not about this this the like perfect slick pixel because that work was about the messiness of my hair the heaviness the kind of uh physicality of film so all that works perfectly that kind of all those textures work good and the kind of analog uh, fuzziness around all those components working together. The morning stutter piece, the one shot in Philly, that was a little more slick. That was shot on 4K. Um, I edited it down to like HD, but when I proposed for that work, even before even before doing any performances, I started working on a score. I mean, I proposed that I would do a score and a performance and a video and photos and text work. So already I was thinking about um, how do I bring music into this that is outside of that environment, outside of that site. <clears throat> and, and again, like I say about the process, the process will reveal things when you're working in it, right? Um, you just have to be open to it and make the, the, the decisions of court, like along the way. And so, you know, I start, I composed half of the music before I did the performance, um, just so I could have things in my body and my head while I was performing. And then after I performed the stuff, I made more music based on my experiences in the space. Um, because like being in the space and performing, you know, I'm experiencing that sight and my feelings of what I just did as a performer. And so I brought that into the back home and I composed some stuff around that. But 
with that particular word, morning stutter, it also rained, right? And that rain was such a key element. And like, so like the rain was like, again, this thing is unexpected, um, but I opened myself up to it. And I was like, this is, this is the work. This makes the work. But like without the rain, it just becomes like a goofy video about me bouncing around. Um, but the rain kind of like brought this kind of like human soul net soulfulness to the work. Um, and so that rain, I incorporated that rain sound into the editing, into the, and the rain became part of the score. So then that video becomes like a, um, a dance between, no pun intended, between like my external score and then the sound of the rain. And then the moments in which I, I have just completely silent. So I think it just really depends on each project. And I'm such a kind of project by project person. I don't have any like blanket rules for anything. And I think I just have to like really look at each work. Um, but I enjoy making music. I enjoy composing. I'm not a musician, I'm not trained. Um, that's just like, like a side hobby. Okay, we have more questions coming in just for the sake of time. I'm gonna only ask like the questions that are in the chat and then we're not gonna take any more unless Zach okay, will be, stay on. You're welcome to stay on and chat with people. Um, but then but I'll be faster too. I'll talk, <laughs> I'll be more concise. Really? Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, next question is how does the sense of place come in, into the work? For example, DC or New York City communities um, like regarding their expectations for you? How, what was the first part of it? How does the how does a sense of place come into the work? For example, like the expectations of like the DC or New York community. Yes, great question. Um, as much as possible, I try to think about that um, when I'm presented with a when I pres when I'm presented with a project or when I agree to do a project. Um, that's like the first bit of research that I do. And um, I wouldn't call myself a research-based artist, but it, research is really important. I, you know, I kind of just like jump on the Google web and, um, and then also talk to people and then go to the place. And so this sense of place is important. And I have to figure out like, so what are the histories? What are the histories that are important to me? Um, what's like, where, like, where am I? performing like specifically what is the exact location of where I'm performing does that location have a history does it have a contemporary uh character um so is it like a place that's being gentrified in that moment right um or is it like a a vacant or is it like a parking lot but before that parking lot what was it um so I try to kind of get under and around those things before tackling the work um, because I try to like, I don't, I'm, sometimes that, that will really feed the project and the work. Really short question. Um, Jody asked, was the crate piece, the one on 14th street art in odd places? Yes, that's the name. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> Hello, Jody. <laughs> art in odd places, amazing performance, um, biennial or, or annual. Um, and like it's amazing um like projects art art in odd places very cool uh monica asks, says thanks for this great talk loved getting more insight into your beautiful work if an artist is performing pr primarily for the camera is it a film and not a performance a performance to me is all about the live event <laughs> great, qu great question great question but um and i so i say that i don't have a I don't have a clean answer for that. I feel like I'm more interested in the kind of slippery, complex nature of what that, or of, of how I've been answering it in my work. And I think that like, it's both, you know? Um, and I think each artist de determines what, what that is for each person. So for me, I have more, I don't know, uh, tension, I don't know if tension is the right word, but I have, there's like baggage and tension around performance for me. Um, so 
the camp, but I'm more interested in lens kind of stuff and more video editing. Um, but also like the slippery, complex, complicated relationship of them both together. And so for me, that like there's just like more layers of things, and like I'm never gonna like untangle it and have a clean like understanding. I'm just gonna continue to make work, and it's gonna it'll just feed my work. Yeah, and I was thinking sometimes it's very clearly both, like it's intended for both, like the morning stutter that's at Nicholson, the video, the black and white piece. I mean, it's a seven minute edited video, right? With music, but it was, wasn't it like many hours long performance? Yeah. People were watching you do it. It was durational performance. So there was like two elements intentionally, like you knew it was gonna be for the live people on the street. And then you also knew you were creating a video, right? So it's intentionally both. Yeah, no, thank you for, for mentioning that. Yeah, so that, that work exactly is two and a half hour like performance work. Um, and yeah, and that was like very much about like the body and Philly and going to those to, to these predetermined locations um, and executing that work. And yeah, so and being wet and <laughs> being playing in the rain. Um, yeah, so they're sometimes it's both at the same time yeah. yeah I think I think it's interesting to think about for a performance artists because if you're just a performance artist and you don't have documentation to then show in galleries right it's I don't know it can be difficult to be a practicing artist right because you need to have work to show or anyways I don't know that's a bigger conversation yeah. but it's kind of layered complexity yeah no I want to talk about that like an, another time <laughs> But another time, but that's like, I mean, there are some performance artists who don't document their work like in intentionally because they want the performed act to, to they want to have for it to have more value, right? So in, in many, it does happen like, oh, have you seen the, the whatever, the, you know, John Doe's performance, you can only see it in person. So there's like this, this value that gets put on it because you just you can't see it on the monitor, you can't see it on Vimeo or IG, whatever. Yeah. And then last question from Terrence Washington: um, How do you decide when and how an artwork should be funny or deliberately light? And I was thinking kind of along those same lines to your work. Not all this like what's that Nicholson? It's really a heavy topic. Um, and you've brought this sort of, I don't know, humor, not humor, but there is a levity or there's some, to some of the aspects to it as well that you bring into it and yeah. Good question. Um, hey, Terrence, um, I, I, it's like, it's like part of my, I think it's just part of my practice. It's part of my personality, but also part of my practice that I, um, I use often use humor like strategically in the work. Um, sometimes to provide levity around subjects that are that are quite intense. Um, and so I think it's about it's a me. It's a balance, right? So when I'm either writing a script or kind of structuring the work or editing the video. Um, I have to be careful, you know, sometimes not to undermine the um, the the content of the work, um, right? Um, with too much humor or too much humor, then maybe seen as kind of disrespectful or, um, but then not enough humor. Sometimes it's it's something that people don't want to engage in. You know, sometimes when when you're just making work about this, the the seriousness of an issue, for me at least, like if that's like such intensity, there's no way to kind of find your way out of that work. Sometimes no way to find your way in, in or out, right? So sometimes it's just like this wall of kind of intense content that I'm like often like I can't deal with that right now, you know. Um, but sometimes levity can provide a way into the work. Um, but I think it's 
probably more important to also allow the audience to kind of like leave the work and also allow, allow the work to allow the work to breathe a little bit and allow the work to kind of like to open up and um breathe like some of those like issues to kind of like release a little bit so i guess i use it strategically in that way to um to think through the mechanics of the work or, or like our ideas or our project. Um, so for example, if you have like 30 seconds, Allison, um, I can share my screen for 30 seconds and I'll just show just some, just some photos that kind of speak to photos that I was like shooting photos. So as I was like shooting photos of myself when like, and my assistant Bella was like pressed to the shutter, I was also like seeing things on the street that I was like taking photos of my black and white camera. And so I didn't, I have never shown them before, but they're like these photos that are often, there's, I'll just show you two, two or three photos. Okay. Um, that may be like too, too weird to kind of show in the work. I don't know. Um, let's see. I'm just scrolling down, scrolling down, verify these photos. Not there. What? Oh my lord. Okay. Oh wait, no, I found them. No, shoot, I can't find them. Anyway, it was the okay, I'll just describe them to you. One work, I think I shared them to you when I did the IG Live takeover. Hmm. And it was Oh, maybe I have it here. Let's see. Uh, Nicholas Project. IG. Uh, Project Inspiration. Uh, behind the scenes. OK, I have it here. Uh, this, this book. Okay. Opening them up now. Sorry, everyone, for the little wait. OK, got it. Share screen. Talking it through so you don't get mad. Um, OK. Sharing screen. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. So this is like, um, it's a photo. It's a photo of a Wawa cup, and I think Wawa is like this. I don't know. People who like are Philly people. I don't know. Like Wawa is like this convenience store that like it's famous or something. I don't know. Um, I think they have like good hoagies or something. But there's like a Wawa cup, but there's like a rat kind of like hanging out in the Wawa cup. I just thought that was like kind of funny, um, but like dark and gross, you know? Um, so that one really didn't make the cut as a photo to be included. Um, this one is not funny. It's maybe a little sinister, but also I just love the kind of material in the grass of this shot. And so it's just like a boot. I think it's like a wedge and it's like leather and you just kind of see the kind of the curls of the leather and then the grass. And there's kind of like a, I don't know, it's a very physical kind of photo for me. Um, so, but it also could be kind of dark. Um, if you think through like violence, the body and then like a shoe in the like grass. Um, so presenting those two didn't make the cut, um, but I think I might present them if I'm, let's say I was showing 50 photographs and they were two of 50, right? And those kind of like photographs were like, maybe there was like kind of a more of a, an arrangement or a more push and pull around humor and weirdness, then maybe I would include that. But maybe not, I don't know. So that was just a quick little Wawa cup with the rats, dark, weird thing. And it's not humor, but it's like, it's like oddity, weirdness. 
All right, I think that's everything we have for the questions. Zach, Zach, thank you so much for your time and everybody for attending. Um, I've dropped a link in the chat a couple of times. Zach will be back at the Nicholson Project for a live performance on August 5th at 3 p.m. So you can register via that link. It's on our website also. And as like Zach mentioned, I think two weeks ago, he did an Instagram takeover. So you could see some additional images, work, inspiration that um, he didn't get to today, but you could get, you know, dive a little further into. So, all right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Akila. And thanks to everyone who kind of came and um, disbanded and listened to me ramble. And um, August 5th, hey. August 5th, come to DC. Uh, you'll see a performance that you won't see anywhere else. Exactly. So it'll be very important because you won't see it anywhere else. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.